everybody. This is Namita Thapar, Executive Director of MCure Pharmaceuticals. And today we bring to you an exceptionally interesting episode. Pharma Queen Namita is going to discuss alternate medicine. Now that's a new one. We have never covered alternate medicine in any of our episodes. And um, today I'm going to tell you a personal story. I use Ayurveda in my teens for my acne, uh, my, for regulating my menstrual cycle. And then for 25 years, I just got busy and forgot all about it. Uh, three to four months back when I felt that my perimenopausal symptoms weren't under control, I decided to go back to Ayurveda. And in four months alone, I'm seeing a tremendous difference in my symptoms, in the way I feel, and definitely my productivity and quality of life. So I felt it's absolutely necessary to take up this important topic today. And in fact, I must state that some of MQR's medicines do blend Ayurveda, especially our breastfeeding um, granules have Shatavri, which is known to help breastfeeding. And it's one of our blockbuster products. So allopathy and Ayurveda can certainly, most certainly coexist. And that is what we're gonna to discuss today. For that, we have my Ayurveda doctor, my specialist and a dear friend, Dr. Bendele. Thank Namaste. you so much for joining us. And our two lovely rock stars, we have Zareen and we have Smita. And very shortly, doctor, we are going to have um, another dear friend of mine who's an oncologist, mm -hmm. a renowned oncologist in Pune called Dr. Shona Nag, who will be joining us. The first question is as basic as, um, there's a lot of disbelief around Ayurveda. Any alternate form of medicine, credibility is a big question mark. When we talk about the beliefs or disbeliefs of um, any patients, including cancer patients, let me tell you, share you the data of, uh, at, which is happening at the global standards. Uh, global level, the data is uh, saying that about 64% of cancer patients are using complementary and alternative medicines. Wow, fantastic. High percentage. Yeah, this is a huge percent. And um, uh, there was a big article in Lancet, uh, why the people are going to CAM modalities. So they have categorically identified the, the needs of cancer patients. And uh, these are the particular things where people opt for alternative medicines. And in Ayurveda, uh, in India, Ayurveda is being practiced widely since ages. We are proud to mention that um, we have a group of doctors and uh, we have separated out cancer clinic and we are running exclusively oncology uh, clinic. We have 18 MD doctors 18 working. Is a great. 18 doctors 18 in your doctors clinic, doctors in my who clinic who look only at oncology. Yes, exclusively in oncology. And how many patients have you personally seen? I have seen patients around 50,000 in, in my, oncology. In oncology only. It's fantastic. Yeah. But, and you have published a lot of data, you were telling me. Yes. How many we, patients' data have you published? Yes, we have 5,000 patients' data That's with large. us. Yeah. And we have developed a software, okay. which is uh, inbuilt with inbuilt artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on. It gives you any answer of right from the safety of Ayurvedic medicines till the efficacy and automatic. Uh, even the impressions of the, if you feed the PET scan results, it can, you know, give you the results of PET scans, comparable data. Why we are doing this? Because most of the time people ask that whether Ayurvedic medicines are safe enough. Mm -hmm. So we adopted the global parameters and we keep on doing these tests every two months. Where can That's I find this data of 5,000 patients? Uh, we have taken Ayurveda to ASCO, which is American Society of Clinical Oncologists. Absolutely. ISMO, that is the European Society of Medical Oncologists, AACR, that is the American Association for Cancer Research. C is the then Multinational Association for uh, Cancer Supportive so Care. All these associations have conferences. Yes. Have Ayurveda specialists presented their cases at these conferences? Unfortunately not. Why not? And um, we feel that uh, it is the best platform to take Ayurveda globally because Ayurveda and yoga is such a thing which only our country has. Absolutely. And we must showcase our sciences and there is a need that the market is all over the world. So when you say that these associations, you've had conversations, have, if, if not speaking at their conferences, have you published some of your work in their publications? Oh, yes. We have presented okay. our data in all these conferences. At the same time, we have publications in the one of the top-notch journals in the world, like um, Annals of Oncology, which carries the impact factor of 47. Okay. 
back in. Are there some really good universities in Ayurveda uh, where if a, if a doctor has got their degree from there, you know that brings with it a lot of credibility. Second question, so a lay person like me, if I don't have word of mouth, where do I go around getting a rating or finding good doctors? Yes, so uh, there are a um, couple of good institutions in Ayurveda. Um, since uh, some of them are before independence as well. Uh, Jamnagar University, now it has turned into university. Then Banaras Hindu University. They have started the All Indian Institute of Ayurveda, like AIMS in allopathy. Mm -hmm. Even the AIMS has started the Ayush Vibhag. Ayush, Ayush department has been started now and it started working already in AIMS. Similarly, there is AIIA, All Indian Institute of Ayurveda. And the one regional center is also working in Goa of AIIA. Okay. In Pune, we in Pune we run the one of the oldest institutes in uh, in Ayurved, our Tilak Ayurved Mahavidyalaya Tarachand Hospital. These are the quite credible institutes. And is there a centralized database where I can get access and get, uh, you know, like maybe registered numbers of all the certified Ayurved uh, specialists and what universities they come for? How many years they've practiced? Does such a registry I, or database exist? I don't think such kind of thing exists, but you can get the data of what Ayurvedic doctors are there through the medical portals uh, like MCIM, the Maharashtra Council of Indian Medicine. Coming back to the disease profile, there are always certain diseases where Ayurveda has a larger impact or shows more, uh, we discuss experience versus evidence than others. Can we talk about that? Like which are the therapies or disease profiles where you've seen the maximum impact of Ayurveda as a discipline? Yeah, actually uh, the biggest objective of Ayurveda is Swasthasya Swasthya Rakshanam Aturasya Vyadi Parimokshaha. This means that whoever is healthy to keep them healthy. And this prevention cannot be a primary prevention. It can be secondary prevention also. When a person is being treated by primary cancer, in order to prevent the secondaries, Ayurveda comes in. When a patient of kidney failure or liver liver uh, failure uh, treated with earlier medicine, we don't want the episode again. So secondary prevention, Ayurveda also plays a vital role. And there are a couple of other systems where Ayurveda can be very you know potent, like gastrointestinal tract, liver disorders, then renal disorders, urinary disorders, gynecology. Absolutely. There's a lot uh, Ayurveda can uh, share with it. Musculoskeletal, mental disorders are also another thing where I can Ayurveda can uh, help these patients. Ayurveda believes in personalized medicines, and uh, like nowadays we talks about genome and genetics, and uh, even now the rate at which the modern medicine is moving. Even the genetics is uh, getting behind and it has been taken over by epigenetics. So what is epigenetics is nothing but the lifestyle. So everybody comes with their own lifestyle. So they have a very typical markup of their own physical elements. So Ayurveda understands it through Vat Pitta Kapha. Right. We do have their understanding through various dhatus and their prakriti and so on. And then we design a specific objective for that particular patient. Right. Then we carry on and especially when it comes to us personally, then we, we keep the data as per the global norms and analyze it as I said, including the safety till efficacy, we simultaneously does it on the global parameters as well. Absolutely. And you know, going to most of the social circles and talking about Ayurveda, um, I see the biggest challenge as uh, people not sticking with it for as long as Compliance. you need to, right? Because Ayurveda is also, like you said, used as preventive, building your immunity. Uh, but even for treating, it takes time. Yes, that has been going on, not only our challenge, but it's to all Ayurveda for fraternity. And uh, people always, of course, believe that Ayurveda takes time because Ayurveda's approach is a little different. Ayurveda right. is not symptom alleviating kind of science, but Ayurveda uh, goes to the roots of the diseases and then any Vaidya across India plans, how can I plan so that th this disease can be prevented forever? Absolutely. And that is where we give advice to, you know, diet, the lifestyle and then some part is medicine. We don't give yeah. much importance to medicines only as such. It's more integrated. It's more integrated. Correct. And uh, I mean, that is how everybody works. That's fantastic. And I think that's a great segue to talking to our two lovely ladies. Um, why don't we start with you, Smita? Tell us about your journey. When did you meet doctor? How did you find out about him and how has he helped you? 
in a tremendous way he has helped me and because of him here i'm sitting here okay. and jab doctor saab ne mere ko mere husband ko bola hai you just give this lady to me for ek ded saal and i'll make sure that she will come back to me all by herself and i did that very i think in 6 months time yeah. i went on my own without my husband's support so yeah. you beat cancer 14 years back yes. with the help of doctor and his medication yes and for 14 years you've been cancer free and i can i can add a little bit on a little scientific part she has been suffering from a burkitt's lymphoma which is a very rare mo she is very precious by the way <laughs> she is not a only cancer survivor but is too precious in cancer survivorship also because burkitt's lymphoma you will get few hundreds of cases oh all over God. the world very rare yeah. very aggressive very rare hard to treat the median survival as of today which is recorded is 35 to 39 months when oh. the people are responded with the therapy right. when they do not respond it not um, uh, move on more than 4 months Anything. and you said a big part of it was your positive attitude you have to be i was always a positive child aap yakin nahi karenge namita doctor saab ka medicines lene ke turant baad 3 hafte mein i used to go down and take a walk early in the morning with a fresh air and that is where i felt yes i can do this yeah. thank you so much smita that was just such a heartfelt and beautiful journey that you shared let's move on to zareen zareen tell us about your experience with ayurveda i had a uti okay and the doctor may have suspected something so you told me to get a sonography done and in that it was shown that i had a tumor uh, connected to my renal artery mm -hmm. and uh, so i went through these three cycles of chemo each cycle consists of three chemos right by the time it was over i was dead <laughs> my voice wouldn't come it was stammering it was wavering i just it was abnormal the way it came. just my body was sapped of strength and many things else right my bladder had completely gone thing else So and of course I was bald, happily bald. Okay. <laughs> so then I came to him. So he very openly told me yeah. that uh, my aim is to give you quality of life. There were no false promises. The minute I heard quality of life, I jumped up. I said, "How wonderful!" And I was so weak at that time, and I was completely finished. But then. that very thought encouraged me to take his medicine give him the, you know have implicit faith in that and the energy that it gave me i in, in a few weeks i was able to walk about this after the last chemo the results were very bad and i went into depression but with his medicines and the energy that i you know came up with help me to understand the good things in life to count my blessings and to move ahead so now it is just something that's in my body i'm treating it but then it's not me i'm not identified with it at all that is so beautifully said thank you so much for sharing your journey so beautifully um and now we have a lovely guest renowned uh, oncologist of pune uh, dr shona and a dear friend of mine what are your views in terms of do we see a world where alternate medicine and allopathy can truly coexist most of my colleagues who are oncologists uh say an absolute no no to ayurveda especially when active treatment is going on Now where this comes from is a lot of our active principles in chemotherapy drugs targeted therapies mm -hmm. newer treatments are derived from similar biological principles and plant active principles and we don't really know the exact content of the ayurvedic substance so we are afraid of interactions which can be deadly so my my only problem I'm all for alternative medicine but if it was done in a randomized clinical trial and that's how i've grown up and shown 15000 women a 15000 women b placebo controlled or whatever and show me the results and i'll believe it and i'll give up everything in a doctor tomorrow have you tomorrow. seen any such data in your medical career so, so far I, so i would say 80 90% of my patients are taking alternative medicine oh, they are and taking. they don't tell their doctors 
This is in America. This is in China, whether it's mushrooms off the net or whether it's, I mean, you can ask Doc, it's really very popular, right. looking for alternatives. So I'm sure it's good for supporting side effects. I'm sure it's good for energy. I'm sure as long as you're not using heavy metals to destroy the kidneys and the liver, right. you can use the herbs. I'm sure you can. But I don't agree with don't eat this and don't eat that because cancer creates a negative balance in the body and you can't start denying your patient uh, uh, food at that time. That's the worst time to start a diet. You can do it afterwards. Right. A lot of my patients do homeopathy and Ayurveda after treatment and I absolutely don't mind, especially in diseases which tend to come back quickly. Right. So like a maintenance kind where taking too much chemo is toxic, I fully agree. My only problem is that women with breast lumps think it can be cured with homeopathy and Ayurveda. And I've had women coming to me after six months and a year with maggots in their breast, still being told that, no, no, it will improve, it will improve. This is where I start to get angry. And I feel that, right. you know, there has to be a coordination between the two. And we have a great example at Vaghuli. They are doing trials. Some of my patients go there after chemotherapy. But take what is tried and tested. Why aren't the, let's say the Ayurveda or the homeopaths and the allopaths speaking to each other and then together coming up with a combined plan for the patient? Why, why aren't those conversations so, taking place? So I think that needs to be sorted out. There's a lot of resistance from corporate hospitals and academic institutes. In fact, the National Cancer Institute in America has a cell where it runs complementary alternative therapy camp. Right. Right. And at Sayadri, we do run a homeopath OPD once a week right. and we are starting Ayurveda OPD as oh, well. It? Yes. Fantastic. Because unless you study it, you're not going to know what's going on. Right, right. And, you know, like when you go to China and you have cancer, on one side you have allopathy and on one side you can opt for Chinese medicine and that's recognized by the government. For us, because so many believers, so many non-believers, so much uh, um, so much misconception out there, lack of communication, that's not happened. Doctor, anything you would like to add to her? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, brilliant comments. Yes, I absolutely. Very and honest I, I comments. I completely believe in every word what she stated. And uh, it is not new for not only us, but all sensitive Ayurvedic doctors across the country. And that is the main uh, reason, according to Sushruta, which is the Ayurvedic surgeon, um, advised surgery for yes. breast cancer. Yes. And uh, we follow Ayurveda. So whenever there are n number of incidences we do have when patients, because most of the time the females, they are you know not yeah. mentally prepared for MRM, removing removal of the breast. But, um, and it happens very regularly in our clinic that after visiting three oncosurgeons, they're still in a denial mode. But we play a very different role convince them at this point of your life, you must go undergo for surgery, that to MRM. Fabulous. And they listen to us. I don't know why, because they are sometimes biased. As of course. She mentioned that people are biased, you know. Mm. And uh, we convince them once they are done with the MRM, then we start our treatment for the secondary prevention. Sometimes they have been advised as per the uh, subtypes of this, we'll go for Herceptin or yes. chemo or whatever like that. Then we give a choice that you can take this treatment along with it or we, because that's uh, the, the point yeah. what she is actually referring that we have kept the data of these patients where uh, can chemotherapy go with Ayurvedic treatment? What are these contents of Ayurvedic treatments? We run a pharma company from Ayurveda. We have mm. CGMP manufacturing facility and we do uh, take utmost care of our manufacturing and every patient is being you know, uh, uh, validated and uh, we are too vigilant by uh, doing their regular test every two months because everybody is scared about metals. Uh, of course, allopathy do use, does using, they are using metal cells. So carboplatin is the metal based medicine. They use copper, zinc, silver, gold as well. So every pathy is using that. Every pathy has its own understanding of metals. And uh, here I want to emphasize that if the medicine is prepared in the right manner, given in a right dose to a right patient, it will never give you toxicity. 
one of the things i'd like to say is this episode wasn't meant to be follow allopathy follow ayurveda or pass a judgment or give you some sort of a decision uh, this was a very honest attempt to discuss something important from a person who believes in both and this was a very honest attempt to call out to the government call out to the institutions for a partnership between like you said yeah. the hospital pharma industry academia government can we not all come together to have this kind of a beautiful dialogue highlight stories like these lovely women present the cases present the trials the data in established credible journals can we not bring a collaborative integrated approach to blend these two wonderful uh, sciences and bring something to the world that is tru- truly unique and truly indian this episode today was hopefully the first step in a long is going to be a painful journey <laughs> to try to attempt this but i am an eternal optimist we all are right here and i really hope we see that day when we can have a fantastic collaboration between allopathy and ayurveda thank you so much badli badli hu